steady long that gang. And shout out to Red Light Crew. Hey, you're one of 12 listeners of the Real Life Podcast. Yeah, you know what? The, to define that uh, uh, better, um, I think the key there is... Uh, I just lost my trend of thought. Welcome to Nation Real Life, episode 136. Tyler Yurumchuk, Wanye, Bagged Milk, Jay. That intro again, when we have <laughs> guests in, we need to like give it a precursor because it's Bob Nicholson on his phone while Daryl Cates calls another phone in the background. It's confusing. I'm saying all this because we do have a guest this week, Matt Cassian in studio. How's it going, Cass? It is. It is. It's going. <laughs> it's so, going. Let me just get this straight. You want a pre-intro intro. Yeah. We so need, then what if we need an intro to that? We need to intro the guest to the intro. It's just all yeah. intros. Like, and then intro the whole intro. show. You like, say hi and we're done. Yeah, like yeah. this guy's voice is Daddy Logneck and we'll show him a, a, a video or a photo of him. So he's yeah. got context. Context well, is key. Context is very key. That was the Yale fight song because we were anti Peter Shirelli as a Harvard boy. So rather than being uh, negative, oh no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Anti Harvard, we went pro Yale. Yeah, For some reason, we're sense. still holding on to that, even though he's been. We're punched. still dealing with the aftermath. Oh, we're going to be dealing <laughs> with that for years. It's like it's like when the when when Hiroshima went nuclear and they're like there'll be no animals here for twenty seven thousand years at minimum. That's kind of what we're dealing with here too in the Harvard era. Fair enough. I'm still bummed you didn't get that job in Minnesota. Nobody deserves it more. <laughs> the fact that I, I don't know how how was he even considered. I like. Uh, that's what I want to know is how he did this job in Edmonton and then he still gets an interview for a GM job. Maybe maybe because Minnesota just really wanted to know what actually happened and the only way to find out was to interview him. But you can make that narrative up in your head. Like if you look at the Lucic and Neil trade and you go and read Flames Nation, their take on Lucic, and you read our take on Neil, like sports fans are experts at convincing themselves of alternate realities, right? So you're like, oh, Chia? Yeah, he's not dumb. It's just that when he went to Edmonton, he was cursed with Connor McDavid and all of those other awesome players. And so he'll totally reboot <laughs> us here in Minnesota. <laughs> Today on the podcast, we have a very special guest, a former second round pick in the 2005 NHL draft. Played for the Minnesota Wild, the aforementioned Minnesota Wild, the Ottawa Senators, Portland Pirates, Houston Arrows, all over the place. Matt Cassian, welcome. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. Ooh, okay. I was waiting. There's a little pause. It's I a just, you know, pause. Some, you know what? It was it just the tension needed to build. I just wanted everyone just to lean into their a master their ear holes, yeah. their ear speakers. Lean into things, your ear holes. The ear holes, their own ear holes. We were looking into your career before we started here. And the thing that I want to start with is I always like looking at guys' hockey fights page when they come in. And I am seeing some very big, big boys on your card, my friend. Oh, yeah. No, I, that, it, it, better than most. I see Darcy Hordachuk. I see George Peros, Jared Bull, uh, Paul Bissonette, Colt Noor. Holy shit. What is wrong with you? <laughs> no, it's pretty much everyone. The only guys, the only guys I didn't is like Steve, Steve McIntyre. Um, we never, I don't think we actually ever ended up playing a game against one another. Um, and, uh, Brian McGratton and we only had one game against each other and it was exhibition. Um, and it just didn't happen that game. So it was, it was really the only two guys that I didn't, I didn't fight. Do you have some kind of death wish, sir? No, I was pretty good at it. I mean, it's, it, I wasn't going to win the score goals. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, the one like, thing you forgot to mention in his stats is that Matt is six foot six, yeah. and yes. 225 pounds. Well, I was 225 pounds. And well, it was close to six five. Shade under six five. I played it between, usually typically around 240. I was just playing like, weight. I'm looking at these names and I just, I can't comprehend what it's like to square off against some of these guys. Well, you're, you're scared every time. I think you, you have a healthy dose of fear heading into those situations because you know that someone can just punch you in the face and it's not going to be like, you know, getting, well, there's another story, getting kicked in the face by a three-year-old. Like it's, you know, some guys you get punched in the face and it hurts and some guys you get punched in the face and it hurts. And those some guys three-year-olds are, kick you in the face and it's no joke either. It's no joke. No, I, the, so <laughs> that actually, so I think, I told my wife this, I, in, in my fights, I think I got cut twice. So however many professional fights, I got cut twice wow. fighting. Um um, broke my nose once in in you know eight and a bit years pro and a lot of a lot of fights, um, and I have been also recently kicked in the face by like a two year old at a gym that was not my daughter. Uh, just wound up and kicked me straight in the face like I was standing at the area to make sure my daughter wouldn't fall off the top of the of the playground thing because she's still really little but wanted to go down the slide. And this little girl walks up to me and just kicks me straight in the face and just splits me open. Like just winds up. That was the one you couldn't take. That was the one. Yeah, I couldn't take. Yeah, 
two year old girl yeah. booting me in the face, but I'll fight Paros, but the two year old, that right. thing's gotta Yeah, yeah. It's just I think you know what? It was the it was the unexpected nature of it compared to going into <laughs> it being like I could get punched in the face where at the gym I'm like, I'm not gonna get kicked in the face. <laughs> and just the the surprise factor, my body wasn't ready for it. It's interesting how when you're talking there, you were able to rattle off like, oh, I never played against Steve McIntyre. I played one exhibition game against Brian McGratton. How much did you study like the opposition? Oh, all the time. Are you kidding? Like, you what's have the, to. But what's that routine like? Well, what's the routine like doing it? It really depends on what mindset you're in. Like how close are you to the game? How have the fight's been going? How much have you been playing? Um, you certainly, I think you have some of those dates circled on your calendar knowing that that's a possibility that it would happen and yeah. the longer that you're in the league and that you're around you become more familiar with guys so you have to do it less than early but mm -hmm. at the same time people have tendencies and they have what they like to do and there's things that you need to know like can this person or will this person throw with their left hand um you know when you're fighting really big guys and, and guys that are tough and that have uh, heavy punch throwing power if you don't know if they throw left hands or not you could put yourself in a pretty dangerous position and and first and foremost for me always in those it was like well you, you have to go into it and you have to you have to prepare yourself for the worst happening like you have to you know you get caught on the defensive or they're taking it to you or whatever is like well how am I going to protect myself and um, understanding what tendencies are I think enables you to have a little bit more of a a natural response to it where you don't think about it you just you kind of know what they're doing so it's just it processes automatically as opposed to having to sit and think and um in a situation where sitting and thinking gets you punched in the face I, I just think a lot of fans sometimes let it just sit in their brains and go oh this guy just shows up stands at the red line during warm-up spits on the ground eyes up a guy and goes ah that's the guy i'm going to today but it's like there's so much more this. like you said like you have dates circled on the calendar stuff and i think sometimes Fans overlook the art side of what what that is and what that role was. I should say was yeah. yeah. We're all there's the dinosaurs are gone. I was mm -hmm. one of them. Um, yeah, it, it it was different. Like you have guys when you circle where you know because there's teams you looked at and you go they have no response yeah. right. They have no response or they have a they have a guy like where you can go and, and you're gonna fight them and you're not as concerned about what they're gonna do. Um, um, so you're not not as worried about it. You're like, well, I can try to push this team around. I can take a few more, uh, you know, runs at guys, or you know, I can slash guys and push guys around, and no one's going to push back. Um, but then you have the games where it's like, if I go out and I try to play the game or my style of game that's going to lead me to have success as a player, um, then there's going to be someone that's going to push back, and that's okay because that's what I'm trying to do is force someone to respond to what I'm doing. Um, or vice versa, maybe they're going to go out there and they're going to try to instigate that and, and, and try to be the one dictating that pace, and then I'm going to have to respond. And so it's just like in those in those games, you know that the likelihood of it happening, it's not, and for me, there was very few that were ever, like I knew 100% I was going to get in a fight with a guy. Um, you just kind of lean towards knowing that it was going to happen. Now, some of the, when I first got traded to Ottawa, some of the first games against Toronto, it was like I knew I was getting in fights those games. I mean, I, the, the, yeah. almost the entirety of the purpose that I was traded was because Toronto was just absolutely abusing Ottawa. And, um, you know, post uh, uh, Matt Cook hit on Carlson where he slices Achilles, and then it was the uh, um, the hit on uh, on Dizzy in, in Ottawa. Like, uh, uh, um, I think, was it McLaren? Or there was the McLaren was a fight. No, McLaren was a fight, and then there was another hit or two. Um, where they just they didn't have a response, and uh, you know Chris Neal could kind of do it, but they didn't feel that it was enough, so they brought they brought me in, and um, those ones it was like I knew that I knew I was getting in a fight in those yeah. ones, like so those ones I did my homework, especially because they had two meatballs. Um, it, 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 I say meatballs, and like playing against the meatballs, they're actually pretty good people off the ice. Uh, in Fraser McLaren and then Colton Nor, which is which is funny because I uh, spent actually a whole bunch of time I was out in Winnipeg this summer and uh, and went out for breakfast with uh, with McLaren because he's he's done now and he's out there and so we went and just <laughs> being laughed about all that stuff yeah, yeah. now. But uh, uh, yeah, I knew I was getting fights those ones, and so that those preparation days were a little bit a little bit different. A lot of adrenaline, a lot of adrenaline. You mentioned now like going for lunch with Fraser McLaren. When you were an active player, how many times were there like guys you're fighting that you go, fuck, like next or this summer, me and you are going to be hanging out, but for now we got to beat the shit out of each other type of thing. Did you have any of those oh, relationships yeah. while you're playing? You did. One of my really good friends, and this was in the minors, this one, but uh, Riley Emerson was a really big boy. Um, you know, played played in the East Coast League and then went over, played in Europe, uh, played a little bit in the AHL. Uh, but with him, it was like we knew that it was very likely that it would happen, and it happened uh, once in Houston in the minors. And I mean, I know from him, like he was trying not to laugh, like going into it, because it's like we there's there's just a situation that happened, so we knew it was going to happen, and it wasn't even like we were mad at one another, but it was just like 
we're going to have to do this yeah. to calm the game down with where everything was at. And he was just trying not to laugh heading into it. And I, I, I wasn't, I had you know better facial expressions than that, but I just could tell like he was just trying not to, he's like, please don't catch a smile on the camera. Like just let it, let it happen. But uh, I mean, I don't know. I think for all of us, we're all aware of what it is and, and what it was. And uh, uh, if anything, it's like we understand more than others what the, what the mental path you take to go through that is and what the physical path you take to go through that is. And you just, from a respect standpoint, um, you, 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 you just, you get it. And so it's like, there's less to get over. It's not like you sit there grumpy and angry at one another. And, um, you know, for example, just the phrase of McLaren, the the last time that I fought him, um, beat the wheels off him and he tried Mm -hmm. to headbutt Mm -hmm. me three times. Like he was trying to headbutt me in the middle of the fight because I had him tied up and I was hitting him and he couldn't hit me. Um, and so he resorted to try to headbutt me. Um, and you know, it didn't, didn't, he kind of caught me with one. It didn't work with the others. And we laugh about that now where at the time, I mean, I was livid oh, yeah. Yeah. because it was just, that was a, that was a no, no. And now we just laugh about it. Cause he was like, man, I couldn't hit you. Like I wasn't, yeah. wasn't supposed to do. You just hit me in the face. So I went to the resort of just like, I'm just going to headbutt this guy. Well, you guys have pride, right? And you don't like, you're, if you're getting the wheels beat off. You don't like, that's a bad look on you. So you're going to try to do whatever you can to kind of mitigate that. Not saying I'm in support of headbutting. I think, <laughs> yeah, I'd be like you live it and cheap, but to like, Take it. Like, we kind of jumped right into like NHL yeah, stuff. Yeah, we did, uh, which is fine because I like I can sit and talk to shit. Love I want, NHL hockey. I, I also want to talk about the art of like a left-handed punch, or like if it's something you practice to bring into your game to protect you in the event you had to go toe to toe with a lefty. Because there's some if you go through hockey fights, there's some hilarious instances when someone didn't do their homework, who throws right. Who goes against a lefty who doesn't know he's lefty and it's good night. I would never forget, as long as I'm alive, George LaRock's first preseason. They were playing the San Jose Sharks. LaRock was out there and he squared off with some guy who didn't know he was a lefty. And LaRock caught him and caught him before he hit the ice and like helped him off. And I was like, <laughs> damn, I'm like 12. You really need to know if the guy's a lefty before you fight. Yeah, it's just kind of natural. Like, yeah, you should probably know that. Yeah. Um, well, I learned, so I, I, my first year pro, like I, I threw some left sometimes in juniors, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't switch often. Like it wasn't, wasn't something like it was, it was there, but it wasn't, wasn't something that I relied on. And then uh, first year pro, I blew up my shoulder at Christmas time. Um, Tom Lynn. So I was in the minors uh, up and down a little bit that year from the East coast league in Houston. Um, Tom Lynn was the assistant GM. So he was a guy running the arrows in down in Houston. And he came and he was like, you know, Cass, like, can you keep playing? I'm like, well, I blew my labrum 97% off. And the only part of my shoulder that's still attached is the bicep. Like if that tears the biceps rolling up, you know, all the way down my arm and <laughs> it's really bad. It's bad now. And it's really bad if that happens. And he's like, well, we need you to play. Oh! And you know, rookie seasons, you don't know, you don't know what, when to say yes or to no. So I was like, okay. So I kept playing and just based on the style of game, I knew that that was going to mean I was going to have to keep fighting and I couldn't, you know, and I know we're not on video here, but I, I could raise my elbow about like five or six inches on my right arm, which is my throwing arm uh, for my body. So it's like, I couldn't, you know, and in, in, from just get ready to play like the amount of tape and the brace that you're wearing on there. So you don't, you know, tear the bicep right through is like, I couldn't raise my arm at all. So I had to fight left-handed the whole time. Um, but and you I, couldn't even do a jersey grab. Well, I would it'd be in here, so it was, oh, it, was a, yeah, it was yeah. a learning of fighting in tight as opposed to usually because of my size, I, I string guys out and try to use use size and reach, but in that I had to fight a little bit in tighter, and um, I'd still throw rights on occasion, but they were they were muffins, <laughs> they weren't weren't very hard, and then uh, and then try to switch left. So I learned really quick how to how to throw lefts and then how to get comfortable with it. But even then, going against a lefty for me, and there wasn't that many of them. I, I'm like, you know. You that guy going against the righty is just the same as me going against the lefty. Like where it's both wide open, so it just comes down to okay, well, who's going to be able to stand in there? Who's going to be able to, from a from a position standpoint, um, um, put their feet or I guess set their feet in a position where they have an advantage on it? And working with Georgie was actually huge with Laroc. I mean, we did that a lot, really, from the time I was seventeen or eighteen um, um, until George was done. So you had a, George LaRock was your fight coach we when did you were a playing in the dub? With the lefties. It well, would have been kind of at the wow, end. Right in post, post-draft, like after I got drafted. And okay. uh, then it was, you know, he'd, he'd organized some ice, some skates, and then uh, I'd been on there, and then we started working on it from there because he you know, figured out that that's, that's what I was doing. Or that that's I like Russia lending place. nuclear scientists to Iran. Like, yeah. stop it! You're arming everybody. We don't <laughs> yeah. need more. Stop sharing information. Yeah, so I never fought George, but it would have been interesting because I we, we sparred so many times on ice that, 
I knew exactly what he was going to try to do, and he knew exactly what I was going to try to do, which for me uh, is a righty. is like I want, you want the, the lefty, if you're squared up. Like it's different if you're just, you know, face to face and boom, it's happening. But if there's space in between you, is you got to get him moving to his toe side. So you got to get him moving to the forward so that he is basically reaching to throw. And then from a, um, a fighting standpoint, I have to try to close his shoulder off um, over, like you grab in a different spot so that he, same, any, same thing, anytime he tries to throw that left, you get him to overextend and to reach, and then you can, you can kind of uh, close, it, uh, close it so that he's you know, throwing basically across his body instead of straight in front of him so he can't get any, uh, any kind of real punch power behind there, which, I mean, real punch power for George doesn't take much, but, yeah. but uh, it helped me learn how to fight lefties. Backing things up, uh, just a quick second. Um, Vancouver Giants, Kamloops Blazers. I want to know when came the time where you saw this as something that was going to happen for you. Okay, so the NHL yeah, going or happen. the NHL is going to happen, no, or getting the dream fights. Fight. I thought we were talking about getting the yeah. fights. No, no, no. The NHL is within reach. Like the dream. I, someone's had a conversation with me, and this shit might happen. Um, probably not until the draft year. Really, I mean, it was it was weird because if you looked at me growing up, um. Yeah, you because know, I know you guys had Sean Bell in here the other week, right? And so he was like, like the you know the prodigy type player, where it's like he's he's expected to do all these great things and and a ton of pressure, just even from a community standpoint, where he was always like he was always really, 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 really good. And I was the complete opposite, whereas like my parents didn't even let me try out for rep hockey until I was like twelve or thirteen. Oh shit! And and even then, it was like I I remember that I got cut from the first team first time I ever tried out for that, but from politics. Like it was, it was, I probably should have made the team. I look at it still back and I'm like, I was way better than most of those kids. But my parents, because they were not involved in the, the, you know, short park minor hockey association at all. It just, you're kind of like, well, they don't really know the other parents. They don't really know the coaches. And so I got cut. Um, and at the same time I was playing football and I was really good at football, really, really, really good at football. Um, um, and so what I position was, were you playing? I was a linebacker. Oh, okay. I, I, I was mean too. I killed kids. <laughs> I was mean. Like I wasn't, right, I wasn't so dirty. I, right. I became an NHL. Yeah, I, wasn't okay. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't dirty. Like I wasn't it's not like I was yeah. cleaning guys like, like Sue, but like I was, I was mean. Like if you, if I have a, if I have a clean shot of you, I was, I was trying to, I'm like, I'm going to hurt these kids in a clean way. Like, yeah, like I'm going to hit him as hard as I can. You don't have to apologize to feel it. No, 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 no. I'm just trying to take him off the spoon. I'm like, you should hurt that kid. Yeah, you should kill like, him. I'm not trying to give him concussions, but uh, I mean, whatever. We can talk about some of those stories later. But um, but playing that, I got a, a, a stress fracture in my shin. And so I played through the tryouts with a stress fracture in my shin. And then when I got cut, I just was like, well, my parents were like, well, you have this thing and you really wanted to make the team. But now the tryouts are done. You're just going to. You're going you're gonna to rest for a couple of weeks here and let your body actually heal because you've got a fracture in your shin. Um, and so they placed me in the lowest division possible because I didn't go to house league tryouts. So I hated hockey that year. I scored like 60-something goals in 20 games. Like I got scoring three or four goals a game. We asked the people to come out and watch to move me up like in levels, and they came out and they watched, and they didn't move me up levels. So I just about quit. Um, um, and then the next year, all of a sudden, then I went to tryouts, and I was just I was too good um, at that point to not – have in the in the rep program so then I, then I made the transition there um what made you go back if you were having such a bad time and not just like fuck this I, I loved hockey I loved hockey like it was I had such a bad time and I wanted to quit because it was like this was just not not this side of it was not fun but from a hockey side it was like I loved hockey way more than football and I, I make so my football coach was uh, uh, uh Blake Dermont I mean you guys probably all oh, know yeah, yeah mm-hmm. if you you know you listen to radio or I mean Eskimos fans here so it's like we all know who that was so he was my football coach and I still make fun of him about this all the time um, he told me uh, multiple times to quit hockey and play football um, because again I just I was big I moved well and I was mean um, for, you know, is, is a linebacker in particular. Um, and so it was like, you know, there's these people that were telling me this, but I just, I just loved hockey more. It was just, it was a sport I wanted to play. I liked it more than football and I love football, but it was, it was, uh, it was my desire to do that. Um, so and, maybe tell us about going to the draft in 05. Did, what were you expecting going into it? What ended up happening? Yeah, well, so it was a different. So mine was the, that was a lockout year. So only like 18 or 19 guys got to go. So it was at the hotel um, in 05. So I didn't even get to go, which is, it, it's disappointing that it went that way because I didn't get to go through that full experience of, of like going to a rink and having all the teams and getting to go up on stage because it was like Crosby and a couple other guys went. Um, I, I was ranked to go late third, early fourth. 
um, round, which is probably where I, I, you know, from a, from a, um, a prospect rating standpoint, that's probably where I should have been like in, in that, in that range. But I know with Minnesota, there was a lot of interest from, uh, Minnesota and Calgary were kind of the two that showed a, a ton of interest. Um, and there's other teams as well and, and did a couple other interviews, but from them, it was like, there was multiple, like four or five times where you're, you know, going for dinner with them and they're just sitting down with your family and, and really getting to know the, the scouts and they're bringing in other scouts to meet you as well. And I think Minnesota knew that Calgary was really interested and Calgary had an earlier third round pick than Minnesota did. Um, so they're like, well, if we don't, we don't take him in the second round, then he's going to be gone in the third round. So they, they decided to use their second round pick, which was probably a terrible decision on their part, but oh. <laughs> okay. but th- this was the team that already had Bugard on it. Yeah. He was still there, right? He was, he was still there, but I mean, Boogie, Boogie, well, I mean, Boogie was from a, from a fighting, from a toughness standpoint, Boogie was, I mean, he was, he was Boogie. <laughs> yeah. He, he, I don't think at that point he quite matured let's call it into what what he was and at the same time boogie couldn't he couldn't really turn um and there's some things that were deficiencies in his game and i think they when they looked at me they said here's someone that can still develop and maybe bring another element or two Mm -hmm. like on top of that so can bring the physicality can bring that toughness but then can just maybe bring a little bit more of the the playing capacity as as well because yeah boogie was just he was just an enforcer yeah and i mean you you kind of get pigeonholed into that um but it's funny because now if i ever do go out in like beer leagues or with my buddies or anything um, everyone's always like, oh, man, I didn't know you had hands. Like, you can actually do some stuff out there. And I'm like, well, yeah. You just kind of get stuck in what you're expected to do, and then you don't have the opportunity to try to do other stuff because, you know, for example, I tried one toe drag in my career, and it was in the minors. Mike Yo was the head coach, and it was I got a suicide pass, so I had no choice but really to do it. Otherwise, I was going to get killed. Yeah. And it didn't even go badly. Like, I, I it toe drag, went off the guy's skate, went to the, you know, the boards and the red line, turned it into a battle. I got the puck, and I chipped it in and then changed. And then I sit down on the bench and Yozzi just gives me the, the finger and pulls me over and he's like, never do that again. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, what are you talking about? Like, like that's, that's what the, that's yeah. literally said. He said, never do that again. And, yeah. and it's just, you kind of get stuck in that and you never get an opportunity to where it's like, I, especially in small areas, I think my game professionally like developed to a point where it was like, I was capable of doing a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, you just don't really get the chance to. And then um, you get labeled as one thing and then it's really tough to move out of that mold. Um, there's a, a missing member of the band, uh, this week, Chris Chalmers, and we're, we'll talk a little bit about him and I this weekend later, but, uh, to, to fill the void of Chalmers. Oh yeah. I've got to tell a story about myself that involves you that <laughs> so you let won't me give remember context. at all. <laughs> I'll give context. You tell your story. So Chalmers, our missing guy, lectured Ladislav Schmid on what it meant to be an oiler. Okay. Uh, and then talked about a tournament he'd gone to in the Czech Republic. Did you play it, Laddie Schmid? No, I didn't. Yeah, it's pretty hard to get into. It's only for elite players, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. goal. Yeah. So in Chalmers' spirit. So I had the honor. Well, and this is just more to support, you know, like I've, I've, I've seen Matt play firsthand. I got invited to an alumni skate by, with Struds and was in Rexall Place, like the last year of Rexall. And, and, and Matt was there and he was like, like, well, there's Smitty on the ice struds, like top two best guys on the ice between him and Smitty just flying around, snapping it around. I was like, this guy's good. And then I found out like, cause I, I didn't know, I didn't know. Like, I just thought you were one of the guys. I'm like, like I said, I'm like, that guy's really fucking good. He's like, oh yeah, he's Matt Cassian. Like he played in the show. I was like, that makes a lot more sense. He's oh, not just an amateur. Civilian. Holy shit. There's no instance where I got ran over and I do you remember me, but I was just a peon that got invited to a skate. So I can attest you were a hell of a hockey player. I, you know what? A lot of skill. It's, it, you know what the funny, this is the funny thing. I'll tell you a funny story. This, my wife is not, she's from Houston. Like we met when I was in the minors. Um, not a hockey fan. You brought a Houston lady back to yeah, Edmonton? Yeah, oh, that's game. Good that's job. Southern, yeah, Southern. That's a hard good job. I know. Yeah, it was yeah, difficult. Nice. I actually still don't know how I managed to swing that one, but um like this is this is the extent of her hockey knowledge so in houston you all live outside um um um, at least then in a a suburb called sugarland that's where the practice rink is and that's where most of the guys live and um so we're out there um she was from that area like from the sugarland area originally she lived closer to downtown um but she was from that origin area originally her mom was still down there uh lived there um so you know we just started dating like it, it just met um, invited her to the first her first hockey game, never been before. Um, so she goes to the practice rink uh, that seats like the equivalent of about 40 people maybe at the practice rink because she's like, well, no one watches hockey. So she went to the practice rink because it was called the Aerodrome and oh, that's what she like. But so she's like, oh, that's where the arrows must play and no one watches hockey. So that's where she went. And then the guy, the, the attendant that was working there was like, they play at the Toyota Center. And she was like, where the Rockets play? And she, he was like, 
yes, where the Rockets play. And then she went and there was like, <laughs> like 13,000 people at the game. And she was like, oh, but anyways, she, she, uh, going way, way all over the place. That's just, just to talk That's about her. Well, That's I, our I, I've got a quick sto- a story about, uh, Texas sports fans. We we're in San Antonio watching AHL hockey the rampant, yeah, and we're yeah. get, taking a cab to the airport and we start talking like sports, the cabbie. So he's like hockey. I didn't know we had a hockey team I'm explaining it to him. And then I go, what's your favorite sport? And he goes, wrestling <laughs> yeah like what the fuck I'm like, all right okay so he just went into a big area. So carry carry on you're more yeah. different game down there different yeah. game no it's different and uh so we were up and this was would have been right after i retired so really recently retired i knew we were uh, out with a, a bunch of our friends like uh, she'd started to make some friends and so uh, a bunch of my friends as well and we were out and it was like well what's the group gonna do and it's like oh well, let's all go let's all go like skating and playing pond hockey for the guys and um um one of the one of the guys their in-laws uh, house had like their own private rink so it's like perfect got lights it's it's you know all in a, a like a they put it on top of a tennis court build a little edge like it's a good this setup. is in texas no no this was here okay back like, here. This right after i retired and <laughs> they moved fuck, back who, here had, yeah no not in Del texas Force house? you could yeah. not do that yeah that, yeah, that no. heat would be Wild. expensive yeah, yeah um but we went and so it was just you know just playing shinny pond hockey with a bunch of my buddies and and some of her friends and you know we got in the car and on the way home she looked at me she's like you're really good at this aren't you and i went where are the where yeah. the rockets play yeah like, i was what like, part of pro yeah, hockey don't player? you understand she's like i didn't realize that it was that much of a difference i'm like yeah like i could actually play a little bit yeah oh. i'm a little heavier now I, could, I don't move as fast but it's like i can still do stuff if you get drafted in the nhl you are a very 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 good hockey player it's amazing the gap in any sport between like a good civilian and a bad pro or a good once was a kid and like somebody who was really, really good as a kid. Like I'm thinking golf, right? Yeah. There's 10,000 scratch golfers in California and you're up here in Edmonton and like there's the local golf scene growing up and stuff like that. And I remember going to golf school in Florida and seeing real golfer kids and being like, oh damn, these kids are no joke. And they're like, we practice eight times a day. I'm like, really? It's winter where I'm from 11 months. The, I'm probably fucked as a golfer. Like the, the gap is so big between a good amateur and a pro. Oh, it really is. And it's, it's uh, fun. Do you guys ever, you guys remember that TV show pros versus Joe's? Yeah, absolutely. Do you guys ever yeah, watch yeah, that? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. I remember it was, it was funny watching some of them and I was just, they, then they did a hockey one with Paul Coffey. And I remember like watching, I'm like, if he tries these guys, there's no way. I said like, they could, they have to, cause they have to beat the pro to move on in like the race event or whatever. And I was like, if he tries, I'm like, not going to happen. It's like, amazing that you can still play men's league because the guys like we've went and watched the all timers game. Remember Wendell Clark? Yeah. So Wendell Clark at the all timers classic or whatever it was, the charity thing, he's in the corner and he's playing with normal guys like us. And someone gave him too much of an elbow and just like the reaction kicked in. He just elbowed this guy into next Thursday. Oh yeah. Why? Well, I, I don't like, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty low temperamental because my, like, I'm very competitive person. Are you a calm guy? Just well, like now, well, playing, well, typically, like yeah. off the ice. I mean, I have, I have a switch. And yeah. like playing hockey, typically that was a switch. It's like you step on the ice, you have your, your switch is just, it just, it's always there. Like you're always ready to snap. Um, but playing men's league now, it's like where I had so many years of that where it's just like, I just don't care. Okay. It's like, it's like, what am I going to prove to anybody playing men's league and getting upset? Like, what are we, if we win the league championship, like, what does it really matter? Like, yeah, it's fun, but, but do you have instincts though, like an old prisoner. Well, and yeah. Like some, that's the Someone thing. Comes like, at you and you're <laughs> yeah, like, sometimes, bitch. yeah, I was going to say it, it happened. And, um, um, I think it was one of the, uh, well, actually one of the girl hosts at the bear. Um, it was like her boyfriend, I think that it ended up happening to, which is, which is funny. But um, I know exactly who this is. Yeah, they they uh, uh, he just he was playing with some old like guys I grew up playing hockey with. They had begged me to come out, so I was like, I was out and just same thing. It's kind of like, come on, guys, like let's just let's just have fun. Like, we don't need to go crazy. Like let's seriously, let's just have fun. Get some exercise. You know, if you guys want beer after the game, let's have a couple beer. Like whatever, let's have fun. And um, then it just got out of control. See, for the normal people, they're like, it's my fucking shot. I, too, was oh, held uh, back due to politics, yeah. but wasn't drafted by the wild. So what, yeah. what happened? Like, they weren't taking it easy on you? No. Well, like, it was, it was, it was like a, someone, like, kind of like a body, body check and then, like, a slash. And then I just. Oh. Say I, no I, more. I had enough. I had Isn't enough. Isn't boy Mishi getting slashed in this story? I, I, I think it has no, to I be. Had, I had enough left in my, in my, like, it, it's still, like. You you learn it's so many fights and so much. It's like you learn how to take it to the line and then not cross it because there's like that suspension. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you actually trying to accomplish? Mm-hmm. And so it got right to that point where it's just like I I had him and I ripped his his jersey basically was ripped off and I think he's under stuff. I I don't know if I wrecked his shoulder pads too because I just grabbed him and gave him just just like a a pull like set. I didn't drop my glove. 
um, because I knew if I did that, I might just. You ripped his equipment apart. I don't know if his equipment ripped. His oh, jersey fuck. definitely ripped all the way down the ripped front. Ripped off like the fucking and, Hulk shirt. Like I pulled, yeah, I just gave him a, a pull, pull back and forth like a like a set my feet like if if he was gonna and it was more like I guess a defensive thing. Yeah. Where, whereas like if he was gonna try to take a swing or if he hit me with his stick, I was like I was dropping him. Yeah, and it wouldn't have been. I mean, well, that's all muscle memory at that point, right? Oh, like, you just you just you just react. You found the switch because like you're you're a pro athlete. You you designed you know your game to like be able to get to the pro level. Well, you're superior to so, normal. Well, yeah. yeah. So you, 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 you still have that in you. You obviously try to relax it when you retire, but like if someone pokes the bear, like it's, yeah, you're, you're just, you're, you're not even thinking at that point. The oh, fact no, that you the actually goes, were defensive, I was, I'm impressed with. Well, yeah. I mean, well, here's the thing is that you still have, there's that still little voice. It's like, if I, if I hit this guy, like I'm the one, th- yeah. I'm in the paper. Yeah. I'm the one going to jail. If yeah. I really actually hurt him badly, because mm-hmm. the potential to do that is quite high. high. Yeah. So like, you know, it's just not. How do you have time to think about that? Like, does time yeah. stop and it's like a Matrix 360, and you're like, who are you? Have you guys seen? Um, have you guys seen For the Love of the Game? Baseball movie, Kevin Costner. Oh, I want to say, is this when he's like pitching? Yeah, he's it, a pitcher. It, like he's go- going for a perfect game. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You guys haven't seen it? Okay. I have seen it. So if you if you YouTube it, just YouTube, you can find clips. And he he does this thing when he's pitching where he, he goes in a pitch and he's like, clear the mechanism. Like he says it to himself. He, I mean, he says it out loud like mm-hmm. because it's a movie. So of course he's going to say it out loud. And he's just like, clear the mechanism. And it's like, I would never say that out loud. Like going to fight, be like, clear the mechanism. But that's exactly what happens where it's just like you, you, you the crowd kind of zones out. The referees zone out. The other players zone out. And it's just like you and this one person. Like if you're going into a fight and that's it. Like nothing else nothing else exists in that moment. And so it's the same thing where it's like nothing else exists in that, but there's still, there's enough time in that space where it's just like, these are what the consequences could be. Yeah. And that's part of what made me probably good at what I did from a fighting standpoint is like, you always have that. There's the, uh, for as much as everything is muscle memory, you still have this little bit of just the, of the pure of the, of the thought or active thinking that's going on where it's going to tell you like what, what's okay, what's not okay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes you do cross that. Sometimes you, sometimes you don't. But yeah, I guess for you, because like you've got, you've got that in you to like have like, this like time slows down and this like you've got, you actually have a clear mind in something that's pretty chaotic event. So yeah, you, you can allow yourself to think clearly because if you don't, you're probably going to, especially the NHL level, if you can't think clear at that moment, you're probably going to be put yourself in a bad position because right. you're reacting. Right. Well, you're reacting. You're not. You're yeah. not. You're not initiating. You're just all reacting, and you're. You're. Or you're going to do something foolish. Yeah. Like you're going to. You're going to overreact, or you're going to underreact, as opposed to making um, um, smart assessments. It is like the, the Matrix. Yeah, a little bit. So cool. n- you retired, and you went immediately into business school. Yeah. Well, I was chipping away at my commerce degree over the course of everything. Where'd you go to? Uh, like eight different places. Where's your, where'd you graduate from? Uh, I ended up graduating from McEwen here in the city. Okay. Um, I lost the least amount of courses that way because I was like, I started taking school right when I graduated high school, like taking college courses. Um, and so it's like, I had courses from Concordia. I had courses from McEwen. I had courses from, I don't know if I had any U of A ones, um, like Thompson rivers, uh, in, in BC had them from Athabasca, like the online, like, it's like I had courses from all these different places. And so over the course of 12 years, cause I started really in, in junior, like the second half of junior, or, you went the whole way through taking courses. Good for you. Yeah. So I chipped yeah, away yeah, yeah. over the course. So I didn't, yeah. I look back and I go, man, I could probably could have taken more than I did, especially like before I was in, like got married. I was like, I probably could have done more, wish I would have done more, but at the same time, you're, you're so focused on your career. I understand. So at least I was doing something. Um, but yeah, I had a little bit left to do. So I transferred everything into McEwen cause it, I lost the least amount of courses, which meant it was the fastest time to actually get the, get the degree. And, um, so yeah, powered, powered through that. And then, so you've adjusted well post and we can, we'll get to this in a little bit, but you've adjusted well post retirement and you came in here in a suit. So we're all respecting you for that. Do you miss it or have oh, you been you success- come on. Like well, you- I don't know. Some guys are like, Christ, I'm glad I don't have to be awake at three in the morning wondering whose head I have to cave into yeah, in the morning. Yeah, you, 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 the preparatory you're miss work. it. Do you miss that? Yeah, you, you miss it. You, yeah. you, you were always, it, as long as you don't, and there's some guys that leave the game really, really bitter, and they, they kind of go both directions. These guys go one of two directions where they really want everything to do with it or they want absolutely nothing to do with it. And if we're speaking specifically about the preparatory work, it's like I miss some of the you miss some of the process because you're so routine oriented. And I still am like, even in my day to day and let's call it a big boy, real life job. Like you, you try to get process oriented the same way, but you miss the routine. And, and most of all you miss, I mean, you miss the locker room. You miss, you miss the, 
the dressing room, like it's a, and the hockey dressing room, I think is different than other ones. It's a, it's a unique little animal, um, <laughs> which is either, maybe you could say that's a good thing or it's a horrible thing, but you miss it, uh, regardless of, of, you know, ethically where you stand about the status of, you know, throwing a whole bunch of professional athletes in a room together and the things that are discussed and the things that are said, it's, uh, you, you miss the, you miss the friendships and you miss, I mean, it's like, it, it's a, a group of people all with the same ultimate objective of, of winning or, or winning, you know, the Stanley Cup. Um, they're all really good at what they do that are going out there and going to going to battle together, and, and it's really hard to replicate that. It's almost like war buddies, right? Yeah. It's like we were in the trenches together, we went to battle. Absolutely. And those bonds are a lot more strong yeah. than normal civilians. Stuff. Yeah. As somebody that made the choice of which route you wanted to go down, what would be your thought on Andrew Luck calling her, calling her a day? Shook the internet this weekend. Said he's retiring, 29 years old, still at the top of his game, but he just he didn't want to do it to his body anymore. Yeah, well, I'm going to go with the Aikman thing that people that are, are I think, all over him for that are are foolish. Um, if the guy's body is telling him he's done, like, he, he's got a lot of years. Like, he's 29 now. He's got a lot of years in front of him. Mm -hmm. And if he is dealing with, with challenges, like, from a, a rehab standpoint and from an injury standpoint, this is stuff that he's going to deal with the rest of his life. So um, if you're telling, you know, saying, oh, what a, what a joke decision or a terrible decision or whatever because of the money he's leaving on the table, I don't think you understand life. Or, or you, you maybe don't, you don't understand priorities. Or maybe you don't have your priorities in order. And this is from someone that, I mean, I work with people and their money. That's what I do now. Um, but it's like the second that that becomes more important um, or the game of football becomes more important than your health and the rest of your life and your family, well, then you have a you have a whole nother host of issues. So I, I respect him from doing it because it's not easy to step away. Like it would have been easy for him to, you know, try to eke out a little bit or to, you know, start taking the easy way out on plays and to, you know, you know not, not take hits when he was going to take them like instead of, you know, cause his quarterbacks, like you throw the ball sometimes knowing you're going to get pasted and just, you know, just throwing the ball away and, and not giving his all to his teammates. I, I absolutely 100% respect him for his decision and I appreciate it. Yeah, I guess like, yeah, sorry. The other way to look at it on the, like the pro side of it in the sense of like, he, he weighed in the fact that he could still play risk his health and, and earn all of this money. And he factored, to retire still, even knowing that was in his future. So like, it, I guess it shows you like that it, it was, it had to have been very serious. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it is, I mean, your health, your health, I mean, how for you guys, I mean, you guys can all sit here and saying like, if your health was deteriorating to a point where, you know, doing a podcast, like if your ears, like if you knew you had to put the headset on and then do this and you were going to lose hearing in both of your ears, or there was a, a possibility of it, or your hearing was going shot. And you said, well, no, if I stop right now, you know, it's not necessarily going to get better, but it's not going to get any worse. I weep for my hearing to go away. So I have to yeah. listen to this shit yeah. on the podcast. I wish, but I get what you're saying. Well, maybe you chuck an ergonomic chair my way. Yeah. Like maybe some of them earplugs or whatever. Well, you talked a lot about how tough it was mentally getting past those injuries. As somebody that you've talked about rehabbing some injuries, what is that like mentally when you're going through that and your body just doesn't feel right? Oh, well, so I always tell the story. So I, I think we talked about earlier in the podcast how like I first year pro blew labrum off 97 98 percent and, and like that's like, no joke no no um so after that surgery like had the surgery in minnesota um um and i remember like one of the the first rehab like when it got to the point where you could actually start to rehabbing it the exercise was um lay with your back like on the training table um and straighten your arm that was that was it no weights no nothing like, like in the air in the air like yeah. go go i mean you can't see like imagine doing a push-up motion like to the air so you're on your back and you're doing like what you would do in a push-up to the air like a stop in the name of love yeah shit. basically yeah yeah and it took me 15 minutes to strain my arm and it Holy was shit. agony Fuck the whole man. time like where you're, you're pushing as hard as you can like sweating like not not like you know just kind of like okay i'm just gonna kind of do it like where you're you're actively like pushing trying to do this and you're you're sweating like you're just you're you're <laughs> hurting and in pain and you're and it's good for it like because you need to move the muscles and um you weren't going to hurt anything at that point like it was it's i mean it's rehab is what it is but it sucked guys like it sucked and then you know my favorite exercise was one where you would stand up and you would you know with your good hands so on my left hand like you you hold on to the training table and all you're doing is you just bend over and you just let your arm hang and you just do these little mini circles and it was like one of the only ones that actually I felt some relief from doing that but it's it sucks like especially any joints like shoulders knees are bad shoulders anything that moves like hips in multiple directions rehab from those injuries is is not fun and 
um, it's tough mentally, tough on the body. So I, you know, if you're having to do that consistently and over and over and over, and then you have to say, okay, and if I keep having to do this 30 years down the road, what are my hips going to be like? What are my shoulders going to be like? What are my knees going to be like? Like if I have grandkids, am I going to be able to run with them? Am I going to be able to take them on bike rides? Like I, I totally understand. I think one of the fucked up things about being a sports fan of any sport is that you revere players, you love players, and then they're out of the lineup. And then when it's time for like a long-term injury to come back, you're like, oh shit, I almost forgot about Andre Sakara. Like, that's crazy, right? He hasn't forgotten about hockey. He's been rehabbing the entire time. And what happens to players after they're done isn't even on fans' minds. And I don't think it's because they're like callous and don't care, but it's just like, because that wall is up between athletes and fans for so much of sport, you don't really think of them as people, right? And, and you're not like, geez, I wonder how Smitty's doing today in 2019 on a Tuesday morning. I wonder how his hip feels or his jaw after getting his teeth rearranged. But as athletes, this stuff sticks with you guys forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's there. It's there. Long it, after the cheers are long done. After, long after it's done. And, um, um, you know, I think, there's, I think there's a lot of guys that struggle with that too because all of a sudden you go from, um, being in the limelight to where you have people that would be concerned about that and concerned about your rehab and coming back. But, you know, you're you're in your 50s. Unless your name's like Wayne Gretzky, no one's really going to be concerned. Like, you go however many years out you have this. We call it, or I call it, it's like the athletic window. So when we're working with, uh, with our guys that are athletes, it's like you have this post-career window where you have... Um, um, where people, like, remember who you are or will remember that. But then you, you cross the line when it's like, you know, no no six-year-old kid right now is going to be like, or eight-year-old kid's going to be like, oh, I remember when Matt Casting was playing. I was like, well, no, you don't because you were three or four and you're not going to remember that. So you have this window that closes and there's a lot of people from an athlete standpoint that are athletes that have a, a challenge with that transition. And then you tack on the physical stuff as well. And then it just, it just adds and adds and adds, which to tie it back to the, you know, sometimes guys go one way is they just can't deal with that or yeah. they have really trouble dealing with that so they have nothing to do with the game or want nothing to do with the game. I think it's messed up. Pro athletes have a very front-end loaded life. And, like, when I was 19, I was as dumb as they get, and I'd be in the clubs doing my biz, you know, you do when you're 19, right? Like $300 to my name, and I was living large. And then I had buddies in the NHL who had already been drafted, who'd already received signing bonuses and shit like that. And, like, they'd come in the bar and it'd be like, Suge Knight showed up, right? Like, it was just very celebrity, very exciting. Yeah. But we knew them as normal people, right? And they're the same guys now that they were when they were little. But, like... Front end loaded, like you guys are basically yeah. at the Playboy Mansion every single day, figuratively speaking, until you're 27, 30, whatever it is, and then it just goes sort of off a cliff. It goes off, yeah. I mean, I, I always say you take, if you take like the normal person's life, like all the things that they go through, and you condense that into like a seven to 10 year period, typically, or like seven to 14 year period, that's like the athlete life. Like, and it starts at like 17 or 18, and you go through so much stuff and so much crap that no one else that no one else does or or that people do, but you just go through it in a, a really short period of time where it's just like, okay, job, like transfer to another job, lose your job, get a new job, get paid a lot of money, like have your high earning potential, get married, maybe have kids, uh, maybe have kids and, and didn't get married or, or you know, maybe, you know, have a relationship and have a kid and that breaks down or whatever the case may be. It's like you take all this stuff and it happens in this really short period of time. So you, you from an identity standpoint, I think there's a lot of challenges for athletes that, transition through all that like it's it's a crazy it really is the the athlete life and then you add in injuries as well like physical not just that but it's like you have you know your your emotional your financial changes but then your physical changes as well and physical issues so there's just there's a ton like it's really really interesting to see those transitions and to see just the athlete lives play out and we so often don't even think about that or just don't don't see it or don't recognize that there's going to be so much more so for like an Andrew Luck thing where for fans we look at it and we go like oh I really like Andrew Luck why doesn't he keep playing you know he could win a Super Bowl you know be an all-star again whatever the case may be and we just don't think about well he's got the he's got the rest of his freaking life in front of him mm -hmm. so as and you're a financial manager now yeah, yeah what is that what what is your job now like what do you do financial advisor so um yeah, funny. I, I don't know even legally what I'm allowed to say without them giving me permission to talk about, so I don't get in trouble from all the regulators. So that's, I can I can only say so much. Do but you no. deal exclusively with athletes, or do you not exclusively? But a, a majority of the client base is professional athletes. So a, a vast majority of it is. Um, um, you know, we do the cross border thing, so we're out of the U.S. and Canada, um, so all over North America. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, we just we do stuff with their money. We we financial uh, financial advice. Um, 
Again, I don't I don't know what exactly what I can't say. Yeah, like, yeah, without, but you're still, getting in trouble. You're still sticking up and defending just, your teammates. Yeah. Protecting them. Yeah, and if, right? I think I told these, you that. Yeah, I've yeah, told yeah, you that. Well, yeah. I, you did tell me that, and that kind of resonated with me. Because it seems like all along that's what you've been doing. That's the that's the thought. It's one of the things I, I think I'd say too, and that's why I probably told you that is like, yeah, you know what? It's a, it's a chance for me. Like the the whole fighting thing was an opportunity to stand up for my teammates, like and to stick up for them, and to be a you know try to be the ultimate let's call it ultimate team guy, like where you're, you're willing to do whatever it takes to um, try to help them to win, even if it means putting yourself physically in 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 harm's way or in dangerous situations. And, and it's more of just uh, an extension of that where it's like, well, it's, it looks dramatically different than that. But at the same time, it's like, well, what I'm trying to do or what I try to do is say, okay, I have to look out for the, these people in their best interest. And if I do that, um, you know, there's so many people out there that are just trying to take advantage of people um, that if you can stand in the gap and, and be able to give them some guidance, then, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to be doing the same thing, at least on an emotional level, um, not getting punched in the face. Yeah. What do you say to people like I've heard the statement made that like athletes don't value money. They they they're getting so much at such a young age and like every pro athlete I've ever met in my life and if you had a conversation with them, they're like strangely down on themselves. They're like, "Oh shit, it could have been better. Like I could have had 41 goals last year instead of 40." So like weirdly in their head about shit, money's rolling in every two weeks like I I've heard and I've seen. Like what do you think of that statement? Athletes don't value money until they're done and then it's too late. Uh, I think it depends on the athlete. It depends on the athlete and it depends on the people that they surround themselves with. And that's that's really it. I mean, just like anything, just like even for you guys here, like a, a podcast, when you put together the podcast team uh, or you put together the Oilers Nation team, it's like, well, you need to surround yourself with people that are going to uh, align with your values and push you forward in, in your career and, and beyond, like to try to care about you as individuals. And it's it's the same thing. So I don't think... I don't think I agree with that statement necessarily. Like I agree with it. There's some mm -hmm. that fall into that category. Um, and typically I think it's because they surround themselves with people that are more concerned about themselves than, than the, the athlete. If I was like, let's pretend I was like into um, motorcycles and I was 19 and like 42 motorcycles showed up at my door. I'd be like, shit, I got a lot of motorcycles. You're like, yeah, there's plenty more where this came from too, Wanye. They'll be coming every two weeks. Like I can understand how you have a hard time. You're just so young, right? Yeah. Like, not many 19 year olds with $300 in the bank were bright, let alone with 3 million in the bank, right? So like, how do you as a financial advisor talk to athletes and be like, I know you're not listening to me right now, but you better start listening to me right now because I'm gonna know you when you're 38. Yeah, well, I think it's just it's just that. It's like that you better start listening to me. And typically I think you, uh, they're, they seem to be receptive. If you surround, again, if they've surrounded themselves with the right people and they typically, or sometimes do, um, if they have character, or they are character individuals, usually they'll they'll typically be willing to listen. So it's And a lot of times too, like guys, and especially in hockey, like they're from like a rural background or they're from like a smaller city. It's different than other sports where you're like in an urban background and like yeah, the amount of people you have to bring out of the hood with you has changed, right? Yeah. If you're from like Kinders, Lee, Saskatchewan, you're like, I don't know, not really that many like people have to come with me necessarily. You think that changes by sport? Right. Sport, well, sport to sport is going to be different. And I mean, you look at a situation um, um, like with Adrian Peterson, where it's like, there's a hundred million and it's gone. Like filing for bankruptcy and you're kind of like, well, how, how the heck did this happen? And I think there's, again, A, there's who is the person surrounding themselves with. And then there's also an element of, just not being an idiot. Right? It's like, easier uh, to blow yeah. a lot of money than a little bit of money. Right. I think that's a lot of things right. normal people like they don't realize because they never had a lot of money. Like yeah. it's easy. It's easy. It can go a lot of places really quick. So um, again, I can't fall into any area <laughs> that is or could be construed as financial advice. Of course I would not. Get in no. a lot of nor we get in a lot of trouble. You. Yeah, yeah. Well, but I, it's, it's I think interesting. Time's a bitch. I know, um, I, but I have to ask a question. <sighs> There's two things we have to talk about. The the main reason why Matt spent you know an hour out of his busy day to come down True. and chat with us True. is yeah, I was gonna get to this. Yeah, he's he's joining the uh, the 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 Dusty Nielsen podcast team with with himself and Joaquin Gage, and I right now the the the, the title of of the podcast we're gonna be launching with them is called Two Guys and a Goalie. Yeah, that's what we're. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's what we're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah that's yeah. that's the placeholder. We're not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I leaked it. Well, I said it last week, so I got to find. I was, was kind of like, content. are we allowed to say this yet? I don't well, know. If it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 we're not it's, giving financial advice. We got, can disclose, yeah, we can whatever disclose whatever we want. all it this. Got, yeah. It got said last week, so if it's if it, it's going to be some kind of iteration of that, but as you could tell, uh, Matt's a very good guy to talk to. Just his storytelling here was was good. You can tell he's made. He's going to do a good job with this. So we're excited to have you come aboard. And actually launch like a pro podcast. It's just not like a bunch of schmucks like us just 
talking who shit. Who didn't think about their podcasting team and who could grow, like, <laughs> we rely like on that yeah. <laughs> But like, we're super excited to have you. So it was good to kind of give people like a little bit of, well, and, and everyone's already heard you on the radio and stuff. You're already an established guy, but now you're kind of on the nation side. So let's see what That'll kind be of, fun. you know, there's no CRTC, you know, maybe an F bomb here or there will come out of your I don't, mouth. I don't know if you guys maybe know this. I'm not, I'm not an F bomb guy. Like yeah, I'm not sure you are. I'm, clean. I'm you're not, Jerry Seinfeld. You know, I got, I got, you know what? I got a two year old and a four year old at home. And so, and, <laughs> and it's just, no, it's, it's kind of programmed into me not to do that. So, and I never really was when I was playing either. Like I, I had, really? to, I had to be tell- creative. So I, I mean, I had moments, but <laughs> I tried to be more creative. So. As an opposing fighter, imaginarily, I'd be like, this guy is very nice and articulate and doesn't swear and Why never seems to be mad at all. Oh, my God, he just knocked my ear off yeah. my head, and <laughs> now I'm fucked. That was all part of the act. <laughs> now, one thing I have to ask, because you, you, you've, you've played in the NHL, and you've played with some crazy elite guys. Uh, do you have any story you could tell or share with us? Because remember, we're fans on this side, yep. uh, and we love hearing good stories. Do you have anything about the high-profile player that is Eric Carlson? Yes. But not for today. <laughs> not for today, yes. That's how you tee it up yeah, today? Yeah, yeah, okay. not for today. Can we we'll ask a question we'll about Eric? Like, is he just like the coolest cat in the history he's, of he's, cool uh, cats? You know what? There's... When you when you see like when you see players like Eric Carlson, um, you know JJ Watt in football would be like a similar type of guy where it's just like they're just physically um, they're just they're freaks. Like not, not in a bad way. It's just they're 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 for whatever reason, athletically and neurologically. I mean, McDavid would be the same thing. They're just they're just animals. Like, and they just have the capacity to do things that other people just cannot do, no matter how hard they work or how hard they try. Like, just a, a quick one on Carlson. I remember walking in. I don't know if he'd ever done it before. I don't think so from what people told me. Just walked into the gym, like parallel rings, like you, like the gymnasts yeah. use, and he just hops up and starts doing stuff. And you're just like, Carl, have you ever done that? And he's like, no. And he's like, jeez. So he's just like an absolute natural at everything. Oh. One of those Absolutely. annoying guys who's good just at everything. Just do everything. Do everything. Oh, yeah. Fuck. He's Nuts. probably a good golfer, too, isn't he? I never golfed with him. I don't know if he, I think, I don't know how much he golfs. That's actually a good question. Well, if he did, he'd probably be unreal. It'd probably be really good. Yeah. I, you know what? Al- Alfredson was a phenomenal golfer, so it wouldn't surprise me because they were out all the time. So he's probably, he's probably pretty good. All right, cool. Thanks but for that. He looks like a cast. pirate. Where are we oh, going with this? Of the hair? Where are we I don't going know. with this? All right. Thanks for your time, Cass. We look forward guys. to two guys and a goalie. It'll yeah, be good. It's going to be fun. All right, we're going to step aside here from the fine folks at Jappa. Then we'll come back with a story about fishing and Big Brother talk. Have you got holes to dig, earth to pack, and roads to build? Then you need to call Jappa Machinery Group. Does your equipment need a service? You yeah, can't fix stupid, but here at Jappa Machinery Group, we can fix everything else. With a full range of parts to keep your equipment running smoothly, Jappa Machinery Group is a family-operated and Alberta-grown business. Here to help build a bigger and better Western Canada. Give us a call or visit us at jappamachinery.com. Jappa Machinery Group. Join the family. Welcome back. Episode 136, Nation Real Life again. A big shout out to uh, Matt Cassian for giving us a little bit of time today. He's great. Great, dude. Such a well-spoken guy, too. Like, oh. you throw anything at him, he's got, he could give you a two-minute answer on anything in life. I did not get the vibe from him that he was a killer, and that's how real killers roll. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like he's Such a nice guy. Face has never been rearranged. Doesn't look like he's... No, because he talked about having a broken nose, but that thing is straight as an arrow. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you can break it once and you get, you get a few hall passes with a nose, but if you break it too many times, then it starts warping. Yeah, like the Hunter boys. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, so if people were tuned into our social media this weekend, they saw something called the Angler Cup. You were holding a trophy. I don't get it. What was uh, the trophy for? Allow me. I'll interview. Yes. Okay, uh, here we go. about his prowess behind the yes, fishing everyone rod. is everyone's ear holes. They're hearing the voice of a champion. 16 years ago, the boys started having a fishing derby. And every summer, life shuts down while these guys go off and fish. And then whoever wins is the king of the ring for the entire year. Yeah, like, you know, when you get with your buddies, you get in an argument about who's the best at what. And then you throw, like, some kind of mini competition uh, to to showcase that that's basically was the antithesis of the Angler Cup. How many guys are we talking here? We're now at sixteen. So this is the sixteenth annual Derby. We have sixteen, you know, very close buddies. We get together once a year and we have a little golf tournament on the Friday, and then the fishing derby itself on the Saturday, which is uh, three one hour heats, uh, where the person who catches the most fish um, wins and. We're at 16 anglers in the Angler Cup, and I think we've only had six different people win the trophy. There's consistency here. 
So it proves to you there's an element of skill when it comes to angling. Okay, so we go what it is we are fishing for totals. Total numbers. And what did you finish at? I finished with 22. And second place was? 14. Oh, man, you roasted them. Wide margin of victory. I, yeah, so my first, I, 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 so I was getting chirped because I was one of the few champions that have only won one title. And this was the 10 year anniversary of my first title. So it's basically, I regained my fishing virginity and I'm getting chirped that should I even be a champion? Should I be invited to the champions dinner? So what we do before the <laughs> derby is we have a all the champions get together. We have a we have a we have a party without everyone else. Do you bring your own vest? Your old vest? Yeah, because what you get when you win the derby is you get uh, my my buddy's mom makes these hilarious vests. There's a lot of little touches to this like, tournament that make it rad. It's like yeah. a green jacket. Yeah. So but yeah. So my first one was pink and it's got all these hilarious fish stickers on. She goes to Valley Village and whatever she loads up. She's got the she's got vests for the next ten years and they can be. They can be 10 sizes too big or 10 sizes too small. You ride the wave and whatever you get, it's it's the best. So you get the vest and then your photo on the wall in the cabin. So we have right now 15 photos with mine will be unveiled next year on the wall of the cabin. So like it's 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 exactly that, the little touches that you get. But I was told in, in, in 2009 when I won my first championship that uh, I, I was too nice in my uh, victory speech. Oh, yeah, gracious winner. So I got the formalities out of the way and proceeded to carve and berate oh, it was a roast. everyone. And just, because uh, <laughs> I, 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 like I said, I, I, I didn't forget those statements and uh, that feedback. So I, I came out guns hot. So there's there's a dual storyline here. You, good, win. Yep. But there's a missing empty chair here today. Yes. Of another fisherman yes. that's in the Angler Cup. Yeah. And in the absence of Chalmers being here. Uh, I'll give you Chalmers' tales. To defend himself properly. Let's whoop him while he's not here. Let's, yeah, yeah we'll, 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 we'll chirp Chalmers. So I'll give the, the, the context that I remember, and then you can provide a little bit of color as a two-time champion. Of course. Chalmers came into the fishing derby late. I don't participate because I think the fishing's murder, and I'm a level 17 vegan. I don't eat anything that casts a shadow, of course. let alone fish for a living being. Uh, but Chalmers came into the game late. Yeah. And then, like, immediately started winning. Like, in the first few years, he started winning. And I remember yeah. being like, damn, Chalmers, you must be a really good fisherman, thinking in my head. And then a few years back, I yeah. started getting some text messages from the boys at the tourney, like, oh, man, this is some serious shit. Like, yeah. some shit happened this year, and we don't even know if we're going to be able to be friends with people anymore. <laughs> they got heated. And, you know, we might have to delete some numbers yeah. out of your phone and, like, pretend people don't exist. And what had happened was that Chalmers' boat... Yeah. was chumming yeah. the water. Chum gate. Which, for those of us who don't fish, you take a bunch of little fishes, you huck them in the water, <laughs> yeah. it attracts other fish, yeah. and then you're fishing with dynamite. Legendary. So <laughs> if you look back in the history of the Angler Cup, uh, Chalmers came in, whatever. We'll just say in year five, for lack of a better term. Uh, it was quite funny how he was super pissed he wasn't involved yeah. for the first four years. Yeah. But as everybody got we older, started expanding. more expanding. Well, and Chalmers was still new to the group. Like, but like he, he, new to the group. Well, he, yeah. he was eight. But he, uh, I did. Yeah, true. true, true I true, did. True, true, true. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so he earned his way in. Uh, and I, first year, I think he finished second. But he, what he did is he fit, he, he started fishing with this one guy who's been a multi year. He, he won back to back years. So our boy, he's 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 he's, he's a phenomenal fisherman. And so Chalmers learns his ways, finishes second, and then wins. And then I think he went back to back. He said he had two in the first five in the comments. Yeah, okay, so it was a split. So two in the first five. But now, yeah. it, looking so, back, he's trying to like minimize But, so, but he always insisted to fish with this one guy. So anyways, one year, fast forward to, the, to, to Chumgate, uh, what happened is these three are on a boat, and... When they would go out, they would throw minnows out in the lake before the start of the round to quote unquote serve the fishing gods. Now I don't know anything about fishing. How bad of form is this? It's terrible because someone in that boat won. So they chum the water. They're always throwing their minnows in there. It was so bad that when you looked over their boat, there's just birds flying over it because it's just free food there uh -huh. for them. So like, and we're just like, what the fuck is happening? Mm -hmm. So, but we couldn't confirm it. 
Who is his fishing partner that did this shit? Just give him a nickname so only I know. Uh, Jerry Macaroni mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Rashi. I wouldn't see these as being cheers. And so, but like they're not. So they, they they just they were doing it without really fully understanding the rules, even though it's clear. And yes, we have a constitution, just similar to our fantasy. The fishing derby group. has a document. Oh yeah, that's it's. I it's, know who's in charge of this because there's always an argument. Yeah, there's always an argument, so it adds a new rule. So, but one of the guys got off the boat, and it's like, yeah. Re- he said, the fishing got really hot once we started chumming. And we're like, what? This is after the wind. So we're like, whatever. And then later that day, said it again. And then said it again in front of the whole group on like the departing breakfast party. Because everyone was. In the, and so we're like, okay. So now a private group chat starts. This gets momentum after the tournament. Right. Over. Yes. Private group chat starts called Ch- Chumgate. Because we're like, we have to nail these fuckers. So it's like the Russians making uh, all the steroids. So we, we decided as a group, they deserve to be pe- penalized. And then, then we made it aware and told them, cause there was some light chatter in the, in the actual group. Like you guys cheated, fuck you, blah, blah, blah. But then once we kind of passed a motion in our own little kangaroo court, we issued a ban. So they had a, they had a bait ban the following year. They were forced to fish without bait. Without bait. Now as a non-fisherman, For can you one fish round. without bait? You can if you're really good. What are they? What are the fish hoping to catch? Dreams? Well, it's what you put on the hook. So, anyways. But oh, what can you put on the hook if you have no bait? You well, just jigging? A, no, just jigging. Just like you put a jig body. Yeah, yeah. Just straight oh, up jigging. Bang mug. What are you? One of these so, people? I did a lot of fishing. The oh, arc shit. of Chalmers is he got busted for cheating in Chumgate. And he was, before then, he was always like a top three guy in, in the Derby, regardless, with the usual suspects of Chumgate. He has not finished in the top 10 since. Shenanigans. Wow. That is shenanigans. Wasn't that amazing, your M Chuck? It was. He's been doping. Unbelievable. So it's, it's so we exposed Chalmers, and so now he has to actually fish the real way. And he can't the, do it. And he can't do it. Like and, 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 he, and he's struggling. He's gotta learn that skill. Would have been different if he would have like came back from Chumgate and like, you know, had a top five finish and then maybe one in a year pass, like even finishing the top, if he continued fishing the top five, it would It'd support like, that he was good. But he could only. But he's awful, and he had to cheat. There's there's a division in time where you can you can you can look at it and say Chumgate happened, and he got worse. <laughs> so to, to so <laughs> Chalmers is a cheater. He's probably drinking Red Bulls. Is what we're saying here. Oh, crushing Red Bulls. Absolutely, Desi. Crushing. I know you're listening. This yes. is Chalmers. Sister. Mrs. Chalmers is listening. Nicest Your lady. Son cheats Mrs. at fishing. A cheater. You raise a cheater. And he's nice, and he's a good dad. I'll grant you that. He's a reasonable <laughs> husband. He's taken his lovely wife to New York on a secret trip this week. She didn't know about it. For 10-year anniversary. He said that his plan was when she came into the dining room for the pre-game meal of the day called breakfast, I suppose. He was going to have a New York bagel. He was going to have, like, a Rangers game on YouTube on the TV and a bunch of subliminal New York shit. He's a good guy. Yep. He's a cheater. Cheats. He's a chummer. In terms of fishing. I don't know, man. You oh, can yeah. learn a lot from a fisherman. Yeah. In terms of fishing, I've golfed. I've, I've, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. You can learn a lot by a fisherman. Yeah. And how he, how he handles his fishing. Like me, I abstain. Like my sex life. I also yeah. abstain. I don't want to participate. <laughs> yeah. But I'm doing other stuff that I can't tell you about that's way weirder. Mm-hmm. So I got to, so this is like one of the, like the best weekends of the summer because you get together with your buddies. You act like you're five years old. My buddy's parents whose cabin we stay at every year. They just do nothing but make food for us. Lots so we're of dips. just crushing food, drinks. Like you're just like 19 again. And it's, it's, you know, you, you, you feel the effects of it long, you know, like multi day now after it, but a funny fucking story that came from this weekend. And, uh, it came from our buddy who got, he got after it. He was, he, he had a big day. He's and, not he's not in drinking fighting shape anymore, but thinks he is. Yeah, so he had a, he had a good day, and somehow he called the, like the emergency call, like nine one one on his phone. Oh boy! Right, and then so he does that, and <laughs> but then you can also hit like an SOS button. Yeah, so he hit that five times, so he doesn't know this, and now. When our like as you can tell by how intense the rules are around the derby, anytime we're all together, yeah. we're arguing about something, whether it be a shot in pickleball or some f- other game that we're playing cuz we we're playing it's just it's a very competitive landscape. So his phone's in his pocket and all he hears is people yelling. 
So like he being the 911 operator. Nine, yeah, the 911 operator. All they hear is yelling on the other line. Oh my God. So, and he doesn't know he's doing this, and he keeps hitting the SOS thing. So, we, <laughs> the cops show up. And so, for lack of a better term, we, we, we call him Jerry. Different Jerry. Yeah, yeah. Well, now his name will forever be Jerry because of what it is. And his last name is a color, so we're going to say it's Brown. Sure. His name is Jerry Brown. So cops show up for uh, for Jerry Brown, and uh, a, a couple of our guys head man the co- cops. They see him like, hey, what's like what's going on? Like, we're looking for, for Jerry Brown. We're like, oh, okay. Well, like, this is our fishing derby. We're just here having beers, whatever, right? And Jerry's having a very good time. Like I said, he's he's having a day and a half here. Uh, and, uh, so then the cops come down to the hill to our fire and we're like, holy shit, what the hell the cops are doing? Our buddy's dad's like, holy, everyone be quiet. There's cops. And we're like, what? Like, cause the guy's just like, we're just dismissive. Cause like, we know we haven't done anything wrong. Not knowing that Jerry Brown is pinned them, like ping them 9,000 times with the SOS button. So they show, cause like we, we need to talk to him. Like we, where's, where's Jerry? So Jerry gets up out of his chair and goes to the cops. Remember his last name is Brown. Jerry. Are you Jerry? Yes. What's your last name, Jerry? Thinking he's in trouble with the cops. <laughs> Already know that his name is Jerry Brown. <laughs> and this is what he says. What is your last name? Pauses. Larry. <laughs> <laughs> that classic Jerry Larry. Your name is Jerry Larry. And we're all there like, you're fucking lying. Like, we're just also like, <laughs> your name's not fucking Larry, you idiot. What are you doing? And then he whispers to him, it's Brown. <laughs> what the? And then proceed. so they have because they have to identify that it's actually the guy to make sure he's safe and he thinks he's getting in shit so he tries to give them an alias i respect the effort yeah me too i like that a lot. any last oh, name man. under the sun larry so we were calling him jerry literally call him jerry like it's jerry larry will never die this Cap- episode let's call it the legend of jerry larry rim check all right has, so we shouldn't name it after our guest? Yeah, Jerry Larry's our guest. <laughs> the legend of okay. Jerry Larry featuring Matt Cassian. Oh, God. I, I, I was going to make it, it lean into your ear holes with Matt Cassian. Jerry Larry oh. X Matt Cassian. Oh, yeah. No, that was good. That's good. I love that the cops show up thinking that they're going to find a massacre or something based on how many times Jerry Larry fucking calls them. They were so, oh, yeah. And, and they were so adamant to like find him. Like we have to make sure he's okay because like we're here, this is what we're hearing the other end, other end. But it's just because like anytime you're around us and we're drinking being the boys, there's some kind of argument. We're arguing about something, whether it be like stats and back in the day or anything. Cause everything's a competition with us. I can tie this together so well. Remember when Chalmers used to live in the North end? Yes. Remember the year he had the house of uh, the New Year's Eve party? Yes. And like we all went out there, but it was like pre Uber days yeah. and taxes are too much money. So we all stayed at Chalmers house for New Year and then we all slept everywhere. I slept behind a couch between like the couch and the wall, you know, privacy and the yeah, like. Man. And I woke up in the middle, middle of the night, four in the morning to hello, hello, this is emergency response. Hello. And I'm like, what in the actual fuck? And somehow I dialed 911 or emergency on my phone <laughs> and it was like staring me in the face and I called 911. I was so vulnerable for having done it. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like just a drunk guy. And he's like, that's okay, sir. We've had a lot of them, these new phones. Well, when, and the funny thing is like, I guess when you push, push that SOS thing, your phone starts like. It's sirens. Like, it, yeah, it's siring. So, so he pulls, the, like he pulls out his phone with the cops and his phone, like he doesn't know, this has been going on forever. It's just all of a sudden this loud siren appears on his phone. Oh God! It was just it Fuck. was funny. That's like people now that Edmonton's turned into e scooter town that yeah. think you can steal a lime, mm. and they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna take this home." The ear splitting siren that they have attached to those things, oh, and they really? can just be like, they, like they can see it all GPS, they yeah, can yeah, see which ones have been stolen, and then they just turn the siren on until you like scream and throw it out your door, and they can come get it. It's like I, Jerry Larry, considering the dominant win from your Angler Cup, Conv- very convincing, almost double digits. Yeah. What were you running as a kit there? So here's the funny thing about the Angler Cup because we're so intense about it. You always end up going to the fishing hole and buying the same shit as you bought last year, but just more of it. And you're always spending a hundred bucks just because you're like, well, I just need more just in case this color's hot. I just have to be prepared. And so this year I was like, I've got so much fucking shit in my tackle box. I'm just going to get like, I just need some black jig heads. I'm out of black jig heads. I'm going to buy black jig heads. Go in. I'm like, well, these red ones kind of look good. Oh, I haven't seen that by. So I, I creep a little bit on my order. And then a, a nice guy comes up to me. Named Jerry Larry. Named Jerry Larry. Yeah. 
And uh, it's just like, hey, did you ever find everything you need? I'm like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm like, actually, no. Is there any new cutting edge technology in the walleye fishing game? He's like, of course there is. Well, of course. <laughs> He's like, come with me. He walks me to this wall. And they're just all these like this, these silver packs, and they're just these jig bodies, nothing special. He's like, he's like, honestly, he's like, they're really biting on these two colors. And I'm like, but like, there's like nine thousand lakes in Alberta. Like, how do you know like it's going to be the same? So they all get together. Sure as shit. I so I grab both, uh, and when we start the first like a fishing, a guy who's never won is probably always finishes in like the bottom ninety percent of. Uh, of 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 the of the fishing derby, he starts ca- he starts catching hot fire, and he's using like this hot orange color with hot orange body, which I we never use. That bodes well for the Oilers, though. Very well. Yeah, that's a good omen. Very well. So I'm like, well, what's the only thing I got that got can resemble orange? Sure as shit, these new things that my boy at the fishing hole put me onto because it's like this like green and like pinkish thing. But I'm like, well, maybe maybe pink will grab them. Started putting that on and just bang. Is there a three-time no winner of the Angler Cup? No, there's back-to-back. There's been multiple back-to-backs. But no one's broken through. No one's broken through. I No uh, true dynasty. Well, no, there was a guy that won like oh, three of five. So then someone did win three. Of three of five, not three in a row. Oh, no, no. I just mean, does anyone in aggregate have three wins? Oh, we have a guy who's won four or five. Okay. And we have another guy who's won three. Okay. Two and guys you, won three. And now you've won twice. And now I've won twice. So now there's another guy in our group who's only won once. So now he's the guy... Who's like on the on the outs because he's approaching his ten year anniversary too of his first win. So now the debates are: Is he really a champion mm-hmm. if he can't defend? So you've okay. got currently on your mantle, yes, the Mark Spector Cup, yes, the Angler Cup, yes, the Stone Cutters won Men's League. We won our Men's League this year. What remains for the Squire Slam? Uh. Well, hopefully the Oilers have a very good season, but if we're talking about me personally, which well, that, things you can control. Things I can control. Uh, well, there's the Oilers Nation Open this week. But you always win the Oilers Nation Open. Well, I won it one year, but didn't claim it because right. I didn't feel right about it. Uh, the team played really good. I think that's bullshit, P.S. Well, it's, it's it's more me. I just I, I wasn't told I couldn't. Well, who just, would tell you? You would tell you you couldn't well, win your I, own I had, I had a chat with Mandiz, and I'm like, oh, uh, yeah, he's a good arbiter. We? And yeah. he's like, well... I'm like, yeah, it's better if someone else win because like it, do- it doesn't matter today. I just it's it's just such a good time. Um, so we're looking forward to that this week. Uh, but I guess the next thing would be like the nation real life fantasy football or my own family fantasy yeah. football, which is the same Angler Cup group. Can you bring the Derby Trophy into the office and leave it here, or do you want oh, yeah, it? Oh, I'll your bring house? it in. No, I'll be bringing it in. Can you put it next to the Spectre Cup? Yeah, yeah. We uh, so we we shared the victory with Sherwood Ford. T- uh, and that's so we brought the cup for them to have it for a little bit, but we will have both trophies sitting here. Trust me. And I've got some real big plans about how I'm going to properly celebrate. So this is what I wanted to end with. If you win the Derby, the game within the game is how you brag. Yes. And what'd you do last time? So I was told I was a humble champion with my words, but no one is will ever beat unless it's myself. What I did with my year as a champion. So I took the, the the fishing trophy with me and Wanye when we went to Europe. This is the first time we'd gone anywhere. Yes. And you're like, I can't wait, but yeah. the bulk of my bag is this fishing trophy. Yeah. So I took, and the Vatican almost stole it. Yeah, yeah, Vatican almost claimed it for good. So I took it around to all the sites of Europe as if it had its own trip and didn't tell anyone I did it. Took all the photos, got them developed, put together a giant email and just and just said in the caption, our trip to Europe, and then just sent that. And no one's been able to top it. Maybe until this year, because the thing you wanted to do in the past, are you going to do this thing in the future? I'm, I'm, I'm going to start looking into it. Yes, it's going to cost me some money. It's going to be extremely, extremely arrogant. But from outsiders looking in, but just, just let it be known that within our group, this is like this is the trophy you want to hold. My first thought when I saw that you Instagram the photo of you cheering from the boat, yeah, was yes, good. Good things happen to good people. My second thought was, I wonder if he's going to do that thing to, to celebrate that he said he's going to do. I told him, like, I'm like, be careful. I'm like, I, I told him my speech. So my speech is here. I told you, I like kind of berated everyone aggressively. I was also pretty uh, intoxicated, but that was because I was celebrating a, a win, a, a win, which is what you should do. Um, but I did said like, yeah, no, I think uh, I'm thinking I might do something this year that might give Europe a run. 
who, what did last year's champion do to celebrate anything? No, like oh, it kind of, it kind of like there's some, yeah, we don't have really like, or what the one guy who won a bunch, like he, he would, he always tries here and there, but it's kind of like once Europe happened, it kind of like fizzled. That was 10 up. years ago. That was 10 years Holy ago. Holy shit. So you get a little bit of stuff where there's some, you know, a little bit of bragging, but I'm going to hopefully this action that I do. And when, when it gets done, there will be a po- a photo, a photo worthy of the at nation real life, Instagram and oh, Twitter I- account. Please follow Oilers us. Day. Hell, it even might even make the big account. It might it might be worthy of the big account, but it, it's 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 an aggressive brag. If you do the thing you're going to do and take a photo of the thing you're going to do, I think putting it on social, tracking how many impressions there were of what you did, and then be like, I did this thing. Everyone saw this yeah. thing, but it also had a reach of 600,000 online. Yeah. is a fucking nail in the coffin yeah. of every other champion. Yeah. Mm. Okay, um, <laughs> so the 30 minutes of fishing has taken over the rest of the topics we were going to kind of get to. Dick no, we've always got time for the, the, the last Kay. topic's the most important topic. Don't we need a second to add? Oh, we definitely need an Indochino ad. We definitely need an Indochino ad. Well, I, I have an Indochino story. Oh, excellent. So, friend of mine, Airbnb is her place. And you go in at the end of an Airbnb, and it's funny because like sometimes they'll leave shit behind, and sometimes they won't. Find anything good? like five Indochino tags on the floor. And what had happened was it was an out of town guest coming in for a wedding. Yeah. And there was a couple groomsmen there and all there was remaining when they checked out was a bunch of little Indochino tags and like groomsmen, groom, groomsmen. groomsmen. Oh, so he bought these groomsmen They suits. all rolled Indochino oh. suits. And I was like, I'm looking at people's trash. I'm going to bring this up on the podcast. Well, when you can measure yourself up in 10 minutes, customize your suit any way you want it at any of their showrooms across North America or right online if you so fancy, I can understand why a group of groomsmen would want to visit our friends at Indochino to get their suits. It's working. Whether it's a wedding, a business event, or you just want to look flossy any day of the week. Perhaps you'd like to be well-dressed for your funeral and you think you might die in unexplained circumstances. Be prepared. Always be prepared. Always. Suit ready. Perhaps you're coming down to Little Brick Cafe and you want to impress the ladies with a fine suit. Pop it into Chino. Get yourself a suit, customize it, order it online, and within two to three weeks, you will have a wrinkle-free suit right out of the box to your door. Perhaps you are an angler champion. Perhaps you look at Matt Cassian and say, I bet you that guy's labrum still 98% ripped off. I'll fight this fool. He was actually looking like he was wearing an Indochino shoot suit. Very, very he looked good. sharply dressed, Matt Cassian. Head on over to Indochino.com. Get measured up. Customize. You are on your way, my friends. You are going to look like Diddy. Okay. We got like max 15 more minutes. Oh, easy. Oh. Do we want it? All on Big Brother, or do you want me to share with you a headline of something the Globe and Mail has written about I just Connor saw this, McDavid? Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. Here's the headline from the Globe and Mail, or this is the tweet: Connor McDavid does not look, sound, or feel like a man who enjoys his work. Who wrote this? And the entire piece by Cathal Kelly, who it's not even a real name, by the way. Yeah, that's a garbage. Jerry name. Larry. He's basically he does the whole thing dissecting Connor McDavid's recent interview. And being like Connor McDavid isn't happy being an Oiler or playing being a hockey player, and he needs to be saved. Has the Globe and Mail officially become a rag? Man, they jumped the shark. That's for show. Sure. McDavid no was in Toronto on Monday, attending but not participating in a camp put on by one of his sponsors, and he was not excited. In fairness, McDavid never exactly looks overjoyed. <laughs> Maybe because he has to read the Globe and Mail. Um, you he miserable says, "Fox, he's a robot publicly." To uh, to basically, like, Cole's note this, he says, uh, when asked about Oilers' new head coach, Dave Tippett, McDavid says, we had dinner a couple weeks ago, and it was good. Nothing too serious. This well, guy- why isn't... So this writer's like, he's not excited about the coach. When asked if the Oilers are going to make the playoffs next year, McDavid said, well, it's still early. Let's wait and see. Why was McDavid not saying, yes, they're going to make the playoffs next year? When asked about the big trade, he started by saying, it's disappointing to see a friend like Lucha go. And here's what the writer says. Here's how you know what a player thinks of your trade when he leads off by mentioning the guy who left rather than the one who just arrived. He doesn't think much of it. But he did. Oh writers my God. Like, did he mention all the good shit he said about James Neal immediately following that? No, all the not social one, media content of not them hanging out Single together? mention of it. Well, Never saw any off-season stuff with him and Luch. Your old friend Bag Milk wrote about this this morning, and it's just fun that the Globe and Mail did not include the portion where he says. I want to start off by saying, wishing Milan Lucic all the best. He did the thing that you would expect Connor McDavid to do. Immediately followed by, 
Obviously, with Neil coming in, he's a guy who's won everywhere he's been. He's scored everywhere he's been with the exception of last year. I've had the opportunity to work out with him at Gary Roberts' facility for a few summers now, and I'm not sure I've ever seen him work harder. He's doing everything right. He's really looking to have a bounce-back year, and we're excited about it. But just leave that out of your clickbaity article. Cathal? Wow. Like, I'm a guy that calls myself bag milk professionally. I prefer that over Cathal. Yeah, I'd rather be called bag milk than Cathal. All right, anyway, so I needed to bring that because I feel like we needed to talk about that. But now do we want to do Big Brother? Yeah! Previously on Big Brother! Yeah! How's that for a fucking hockey? That's what I'm talking about. (laughs) Shut up! Yes, you ram chuck. Oh, right in my ear holes. I guess you can get an ear injury doing a podcast. (laughs) Jesus. That was actually just really quickly, really sad when Cassian was trying to relate to us. And he's like, it'd be like if you guys <laughs> could injure yourself podcasting. It could happen. How would you feel? Fucking like, peasants. Oh, God. A gangrenous <laughs> paper cut. Well, yeah. Let's pretend those earphones you're wearing pinched your brain and it came out your nose. I can see myself drinking too much coffee, having some kind of coffee related something. I don't know if that could be a thing. So Big Brother US update. Now, Jay, earlier today... I'm not good with like show related secrets because I always want to tell you all the exciting shit. So one of the rules of real life is like you got to come to the show having watched Big Brother or you can't bitch. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then I'm like, oh man, that thing. And you're like, fuck. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I always do that. I'm sorry. And then you went home at lunch and watched BB. So I commend you for your commitment to the craft. Hey, there's the, it, there's only one rule in real life, and is be cut up. Wear your pants. No, big, big. Yeah, clothing optional as well. It's the second rule. Respect. This week was a shocking week for me. I couldn't believe it. Oh. Because Christy goes on the block with Annalise, who is the unflavored yogurt in the fridge. Seemed like a done deal. Very inoffensive. Unoffensive. Mm -hmm. And when Mickey put her up, she's like, I'm Mickey, I'm a pawn. You gotta be careful. Pawns go home. And I was like, yeah, but not you, Annalise, because Christy is like public enemy number one. Yeah. And then she goes out and gives a speech where she's like, it's Nick that you should be worried about, who isn't even involved in the block, isn't doing anything. Keep me, and I'll go after the guy everybody likes. And they kept her. Like a seven to one vote. She created some kind of narrative in her own mind. She manifested. Well, but initially, but like, but I liked, but I I, I respect the arc that it went on because she's just like, why isn't Nick on the block? That's so shady and just making up all this stuff. But she whines and cries enough about it in front of a lot of people that all of a sudden she kind of creates an element of truth to it. Forceful hysteria. And then goes to Mickey, gets him on side, but she planted seeds being like, I'm going after Nick. I'm going after Nick. And Nick... Lost his cool, which he, he fucked up. He turned a weird shade of gray. Yeah. yeah. He, 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 well, he went to go blow her game up, and she calmly just, like, systematically beat the fuck out of him. Well, and his rebuttals were garbage. Garbage, because he was, he was in an emotional state, yeah, and she was calm. Yeah. He did that thing where he rounded up the house saying, yeah. we're going to do this. It's Taco Tuesday. Everybody's going to enjoy some delicious tacos, and I'm going to blow someone's game up, and he did not do no, that. No, he, he needed to wait for her to be hysteric yeah. and be calm, so he got a very bad look there. If Nick goes home and Christy outlasts Nick, that Taco Tuesday is one of the most quickly shifting situations in any Big Brother I've ever seen. Yeah. They go into that argument. I'm like, oh, shit. They're going to serve Christy up on a taco. Walked out. like, oh, shit. Nick just absolutely yeah. embarrassed like himself. Yeah, like, like, as credit much where as credit's due. Yeah, like, yeah. She drives me crazy, but like, she created a storyline, stayed with it, even though it was all fake, and then called him out on it publicly, made him look bad, and then put her in a very safe place where people actually started to believe her enough to keep her around. But she's like, I'll be a pawn. You can put me up. But oh, she's yeah. talking to Mickey, and they're like, okay, you have to go up. She's like, I didn't think it'd be so soon. Yeah, because she goes right back to her, makes yeah. a deal. And then, yeah, the minute she's like, put me up as a pawn. Like, I'm your weapon. Use me as, as you see fit, whatever to stay. Put you up, yeah, immediately. Yeah, I didn't think it'd be so soon. Oh, I didn't soon. think it'd be so soon. Shut up, Christy. Jesus. Oh, How like about Big Brother looking at her eating habits? Oh, oh Production like me. rips people apart on that show. Yeah, man. man. I'm actually looking forward to seeing, well, it depends, I guess, who goes home, but seeing what Zingbot does with her. Oh, yeah. This is my favorite time of a Big Brother year because 
at the end of the season, it's just like a big empty house, and yeah, like yeah, the yeah. remnants of the knife fight are still there, kind of looking at each other. Blood's still on the ground. Too early in the year, everybody's bumping into each other, and there's too many people there. But right now is the sweet spot. Yep. Because all the garbage is gone for the most part. There's a few floaters left in it. But like, who do you like, Bagman? I'm still liking my boy Cliff, man. Cliff? Yeah. During that entire blow up on Taco Tuesday, boy Cliff is just sitting there with those arms crossed, just studying it all. Taking that, it all in. He knows how to stay calm and he just kind of stays private. But he also he also tells you everything about his game, but not like I don't know, he just he just gets it done. Even in uh where are we? Monday, last night's episode where he found a way to keep Nicole safe. Make I deal, like him, man. He stands deals. up for people that he's But I th- I thought that was risky too, doing that, being like, hey, just so you know, I'm a lot closer with Nicole than you think. Yeah. And I was like, Well, don't tell a lot to because who do you say that to? Christy? Christy. Well, you give that to Manifest Destiny, and she'll <laughs> spin that around about how Nicole <laughs> and Cliff are planning to take out Holly. Manifest. That's good. So I'm that's the Big Brother talk, or we got more? Who do you like this season? You're MJ? Who's going to win? Up until like we got Cliff on a the couple board. days ago, I liked Nick. I was like, hey, he's like floated into the back end of like this Christy Tommy alliance. Like I liked. I kind of like that move for him because I was like, okay, there's bigger targets ahead of him, but he's also protected a little bit now. Like, I felt like that would help him make it through a few weeks. He's a comp guy. I think, he, yeah. like, based on the fact that, what, Mickey is the only, like, alpha male, although Tommy wins a lot of comps. But in terms of, like, physical comp beasts, it was Nick, Tommy, and Mickey really left, mm-hmm. right? So it was like, okay, Nick's in a good spot comps-wise, yeah. good spot within an alliance that looked like it was maybe okay, even though I hate all of them. I thought Nick was in a good spot, and now it's just Killed completely it. withered away. Yeah, like, and he's, he, he's a psychologist. Like, he's yeah. the one that should have been, like, the bigger person there and let the craziness happen. That house will fuck you up, though, right? Yeah. Oh, I know, I know. You forget who you are quickly. Who do you like, Jay? Who do you like to win? Well, I always do like Cliff, but you know what? I like, you know, and, you know, they produce the show to kind of, you know, look a little bit different maybe than what it is, but, like, I kind of like the fact that Tommy was willing to, like, cut bait on Christy. You know, I, I like Tommy's game. See, he's I, got 500 grand and nothing else in his eyes, it seems like. Yeah, like Tommy's stuff smart. Like that. Like it's interesting, a- though, to watch Cliff be like, hey, I roll with Nicole. Yeah. And Tommy's my pick, right? He's my yeah. boy, my little elf, my little Broadway sprite, bringing a daily dose of joy. I do love when he gives, like, a kick or something. <laughs> For no or, like, reason. A Everything is beautiful. It's wonderful. But yeah. when he's just like, yeah, I'm probably going to have to fucking cut Christy loose. I'm like, uh, what the hell? Yeah, I, I love, love that your ride or die. He's like, yeah, she's pretty much dead to me at this point. Whereas, like, Cliff's going to war for his kids. <laughs> Tommy's malleable, right? Well, How? because you want to, he, he, he actually plays all sides, he but does. on the social side. He's hugging everybody. Like, he gets into bed with Christy. He's, like, hugging her and shit. And he's looking at the cameras. Like, that's the cold-blooded shit that will take yeah. you to the championship. That's right. How funny was it when it was the whole, like, you can always look at me and see home. And Christy's oh, like, she's like, what? what? <laughs> and he, like, says it two more times. And she's like, no. And but that one was oh. so funny. He, like, they were having a full on conversation up until he said that sentence. Yeah. yeah. And she couldn't comprehend it. Like, nothing changed. It's not like yeah. he started talking quieter. I love when they're throwing She's... the subtitles of gibberish in yeah. the season. Oh, yeah. right? <laughs> From Flavity D. Gibber. Oh, yes. killer. All right. Well, it's the time of the summer where it's 12 degrees. <laughs> and I think fucking, your Ramchuk doesn't like this podcast. Yeah, I don't think Tyler he's, likes Oh, he's here. trying to end it the moment it starts. Damn right. He wants to be a one-second podcast. My job is to keep this thing on fucking track. That's true. It's that. We'll close with this. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, good point. Allegedly. So, <laughs> the Connor McDavid doesn't want to be in Edmonton. Rumors are on blast in Toronto. Yeah. It's That's all tw- they got. It's 12 degrees out, which means it's late August. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think like the the silly season is over for hockey. September first rolls around, back into game time mode. She's trying to be Christy and create a false narrative, and trying to get us to buy in. So mm. we turn our backs on Nick, aka Connor McDavid. Did you say she? Did you say her name's Bethel? Cathel, and it's a dude. Oh, Cathel Kelly is his name. You oh, know a lot but, of but girls. Also, but I was also you know a lot of girls Christy named Bethel. She. Yeah, yeah. Christy is the she in this. Yeah, anyways. no, but uh, oh, okay. hey, it's my girlfriend Bethel. No, oh, uh, my name's Bethel too. Oh, you're all named Bethel. Well, here. you Calm wait till down. you meet my boyfriend Jerry Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Bethel toothbrushes for everybody. <laughs> That's it. We're done. All right, Nation Real Life. Hope you enjoyed 40 minutes with Cassian, 40 minutes on fishing, and 20 minutes Which on Cassian? Big Brother. Matt Cassian. Matt. You said Zach. Yep. Did I? Yep. I'm Burn. Gonna, yep. No one will ever know because I'll edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 136, Nation Real Life, is over.